Parker Hannafin Corp. is a very high-quality, investment-grade, triple-B-plus rated industrial machinery company that the recent correction has brought into fair value. As you can see, the stock was overvalued for most of 2021, and it's now come back into fair value. It has a very good dividend record, a dividend yield of 1.95%, which is slightly above the 1.37% average on the S&P. Hello, everybody. This is Chuck Carnival, co-founder of Fast Graphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer Software Tool. So I've titled this video, Four Stocks That the Bear Market or the Recent you know, Downward Movement in the Market Has Brought Us. I don't think we're quite officially a bear market yet, but we're pretty close. And a lot of people are concerned. But one of the things that is often forgotten when people are overlooked, maybe is a better way of saying it, when people come into a bear market, it brings up a lot of anxiety and a lot of panic. And the reality is often what it really brings is opportunity. I joke all the time and say, you know, that I live in money manager hell. When my clients are giddy and happy, I'm depressed. When my clients are depressed, I'm giddy and happy. And what that means is as Mr. Valuation, as many of you know me by, I'm looking for bargains. I always want to invest in the stock at a bargain. I want to be able to participate fully in the value that that company is potentially capable of offering me. And one way to do that is to be very, very anal, if you will, excuse the language, to valuation. I, I mean, I, I want to see good value regardless. And no matter how much I like a company, I won't invest in it if I don't think the value is there because as good as the company is that I might think it is, I'm still not going to be able to participate in its, you know, to the full measure of what it produces because in the long run, earnings determine market price. Now, you can interject the word cash flow, EBITDA, a lot of other fundamentals into that statement. But the point is the operating success of the business is ultimately what makes it a good or, or bad investment in the long run. So I've come up with four companies here. Most of them are probably overlooked. I'm going to go through this portfolio very quickly with you. This is a pre-research group of companies. I want to make that, I want to emphasize that. What's happened is by utilizing the FastGraphs Fundamental Analyzer software tool, I've been able to identify these four stocks as really high quality dividend paying stocks that I could invest in that are now trading at attractive valuations. They're all investment grade. The lowest is Pantera, which we'll cover, triple B minus, and two of them are B plus and the third is triple B. So these are all good investment grade companies. They're re relatively small companies. You know, Parker Hannafin is $35 billion, but the other three are under $10 billion. Now, three of these four have created an opportunity because of the market. The market's given it to us. Owens Corning is just a very cheap stock that I've identified. They all have dividend yields above the 1.37% of the market, and they're in building products and industrial machinery. This is, a, again, an overlooked industry often. These companies don't necessarily get the press or the large following that a lot of companies do. All of them have my earnings yield above the six and a half to seven percent that I believe it gives me that ability to participate fully in the measure of the company. So I'm going to go through these very briefly and I want to point out this is the first step in a more comprehensive research process, but it's a very, very important step. Because what I'm suggesting is when I'm going to go look at a company and research it thoroughly, the first thing I want to see is, is the company research worthy? In other words, you know, does the company offer me the value and the attributes and the characteristics that I want in a company that I'm willing to invest in? Because I am a long-term investor and my whole objective of doing all this work and spending all this time investing in the stock is I want to be able to own it long-term. So the first one I'm going to look at is Fortune Brands and Security. Now, what I do is I've identified it as a very undervalued stock in the building products industry. I will go into the links that FastGraphs provides. I will go into the companies directly into the company's website and do my best to learn as much as I can about the company. Now, I would go through all of this. You know, I would spend some time here. I don't do it in these videos, but I could spend an hour or more, you know, learning what I can about the company. Now, what I like is I, there's certain characteristics I like here. So let's get that pesky price off of the graph and make the point. I like to see operating earnings growing consistently. They've grown at over 22.6%. So we're identifying value on this company in this long-term perspective as a PE of 22.6. So anywhere I touch this orange line, 
It's also a dividend paying stock. And I see that the company started paying a dividend in 2013. That's the white line on the graph. And it's increased the dividends every year since it's paid one, which I really, really like. To me, the most predictable and reliable metric that you can evaluate when you're looking at a common stock is the dividend and the dividend record. You know, the reason I like dividend paying stocks so much is that what you've got here is a representation of the company's profits. That's the dark green shaded area. The area below this is the profits that they share with you directly as an investor through their dividend. If you put a big, you know, a nice high quality growth stock, even like Amazon on here, your sole way of making money is for the price to go higher than what you paid for it. In the case of a high quality dividend paying stock, you are participating, you're profit sharing in the business. The company's paying you a percentage of their profits and dividends. Now, this company is a fast growing company. And as I want you to notice, their payout ratios is, you know, in the 18 to 25 percent range. OK, that means they've got a lot of room to increase that dividend if they wanted to. But that's a very reliable line. Now, the price is going to track what the business does in the long run. In the short run, emotions determine market price. But in the long run, earnings determine market price or whatever metric. And you can see that clearly. And this becomes a baseline of value, if you will, the orange line. And you can see there were times when the price was significantly above that baseline of value. And that was a relatively poor time to invest in this company. You made about 5% a year, and yet the company's earnings, as you can see here on the bottom, were 69%, 16%, 19%, 33%. But you missed out on all of that tremendous growth because you had to overpay for the stock. Now, once you bought the stock in value and held it even to its undervalued position today, you made about 8.5%. But if you'd have measured that when the stock is trading at value, so if I go from value to value, then I'm getting 16% rate of return, which is another way of saying I'm fully participating in the growth of the stock during this time frame that I've just measured here. And I'm getting a dividend on top of that to boot. So the company looks very, very attractive. Blended PE of 11.6. Dividend yield, as I mentioned, is 1.6. Very, very attractive earnings yield of 8.6. Market cap of under $10 billion, $9 billion, and it's triple B plus rated and has 54% debt to capital, which is, you know, normal. You know, anything under 60%, I would consider manageable. And we're going to look at that in different ways now. So now that I've identified this company as being very inexpensive, and again, note how often it goes to the 23 times earnings. But I want to make a caveat. I'm going to cut the time frame down here. And I want you to notice now that growth rate has dropped to 14%. Okay, that's critically important. That's one of the benefits of this tool. I can see how has the company been holding up relative to its growth rate. Now, I shortened the time frame, including the estimates here with, you know, one year, a year and a half, if you will. These are obviously your calendar years. This has a calendar fiscal year. I've got 18% growth. But now, all importantly, I'm going to go into forecasting and see what the analysts, you know, are thinking going forward. Now, there are 18 analysts. The estimates have been rising for 2022 from $6.34 six months ago to $6.44 to $6.50. I really like that. It's now currently $6.51, so it's risen just slightly, you know, before the most recent estimate prior to this one was given. This gives me a nice margin of safety. This gives me the potential to make significant rates of return, plus this dividend kicker. Now, long-term performance of this company is going to be relative to the valuation, okay? So if I'm looking at it from here, it was overvalued and went to undervalued. It's not going to perform very well. If I go to max, it was just about, just slightly overvalued here. You know, the PE here would, would have been representative of 22 times earnings would have been fair value. But the company still generated pretty decent performance, even outperformed the S&P, which has had one of the best runs it's ever had in both dividend income and capital appreciation. And that was the result of slightly overpaying for the stock. Imagine what you can do when you can buy it this cheaply. Now, very quickly, because I'm still in the pre-research, you know, the first step of my research process, I'm going to check other metrics. I'm going to check gap items like diluted. Company doesn't do a lot of accounting, you know, mumbo jumbo with very stable, good stable diluted earnings also. It looks very, very inexpensive based on diluted earnings, 1187 I'm going to switch then to cash flow. This is all important because I'm, although I'm, I'm looking at price here, I'm mostly concerned 
is the operating cash flow, the orange line, the, the operating cash that the company's producing, is it supporting and covering the dividend? And you can see they cover it like a blanket. And then the same would be to the all important free cash flow. This is what's left over after everything you spent to run the business. So I would go down here and, you know, notice that they've got great operating cash flow. So everything I see so far, you know, based on the metrics. Now I'm going to look at EBITDA and you know, other metrics. So I'll just go through this process as I go through it. I like to use price to EBITDA because that's a pretty good valuation metric I found over time. So I will look at that. And then I would also look at the all important price to sales. And this company normally trades at a price to sales of 1.7. It's currently trading at 1.23. So in every way I measure this from, you know, my traditional metrics, the company looks like a bargain. Then I would go deeper. I would go into fund graphs, okay, and I would use the health check feature, which is coming very, very soon, where you can see that we're testing it. This is in our development site. We're getting very close to launching this. We have a couple of adjustments to make on it, but it seems to be working very well. But I'll go through this quickly on this first. I'll look at the margins. The gross margins are above industry standards. Now, you know, industry standards is about 31 gross margin. They're generating 35%. I'm really interested in the last decade on all these companies. So I'm going to look at them from the last decade. You know, you can see that their operating margin, which is EBIT, earnings before interest and taxes, is also higher than industry standards. And their net margins are higher than industry standards. So, so far, and I'm going to stop here, so far, everything I've seen here makes me want to look very, very deeply to Fortune Brands. Now, this is a total return type investment. It has above average dividend yield, but it's not really a great income investment, except for the fact that if you look at it historically, they've grown their dividend by over 16% compound growth rate and 17.75 on average since they've been paying one. So it's got a very excellent dividend record as short as it is. So I like this company very much for if I was investing for total return or if I'm talking to investors that are interested in total return, Fortune Brands would be one such company I would put on the list. So let's move on to our next candidate is Owens Corning. This is a building products company as well. Again, first thing I do is go into the company and find out what businesses they're in insulation, commercial and institutional insulation, composites. I would, again, spend a lot of time in here learning as much about what the company is. Now, one thing I didn't necessarily mention strongly enough, I will also take advantage of research sites. Like, for example, I'll go into Seeking Alpha, which does crowdsourced research, and I'll look at, you know, what various writers on Seeking Alpha are thinking about the company. I like to look at their news. I get a very nice company profile here, which tells me a profile. I'm building a knowledge base of the company that I'm considering right now. Now, let me say why that's important. When you do hit bear markets, like we're currently, you know, approaching right now, the more you know about your company and the better you understand your company, the better chance you have of staying the course. And that's usually the best process. Imagine had you sold out of Owens Corning back here during the, you know, debacle the, at the bottom of the Great Recession, if you'd have went ahead and sold out at that point, you'd have missed out on 21% annualized rate of returns over the next, you know, decade or more. So, you know, being a long-term investor is critically important. Going into the health check on Owens Corning, again, I'm going to go through this very quickly because I'm just giving you what the process here more than anything their gross margins are below industry norms generally, but for the last seven or eight years, their net margins have been above that. So that's something I like. You know, just because it's below industry norms, by the way, I want to add, doesn't mean I throw the company away. The question is, is, you know, is a 22% gross margin or 23% gross margin a decent margin? And my answer is yes. Now, their net margins have been, you know, a little suspect over the years. But partially that, you know, that might partially explain why the stock is trading at such a low valuation today. So I would, you know, look at that return on assets. I want to see the all important return on assets. The company's not generating a great deal of a return on assets, but more recently they have actually generated higher returns on assets and the market in general. You know, that you can see that what the average industry norms have been, but the company has strung together, as I want to remind you, a great deal of profit. So this would be something I'd be interested in. Returns on equity for the last 10 years, they're also a little bit below industry norms, but they're still positive. You know, their return on equity is 7% in 2017 versus 13 for, you know, the industry average. 
their return on equity was negative in 2020. And, you know, 2021, they're showing, again, as I mentioned earlier, you know, promise. Their sales have been grown at about 4.76%. I like that. Net income has been growing at about 13.68%. I like that. It looks like coming out of COVID, they had a down year. Their asset turnover, which indicates, you know, how efficiently they're, you know, utilizing their assets, have been well within industry norms. They're not, uh, they're slightly below it, but decent. Operating cash flow higher than net income. Generally, it's always been. They're in the green on that regard, so I really like that. And then long-term debt to equity is another metric that I think is real important. For every dollar of capital they have, 71% is debt. So, you know, that's a way to look at Owens Corning. But, but you know, I've got several other metrics here that, I again, I'm going through this quickly, that I'm not going to go through all. But I can also look at, you know, debt to equity. Debt to equity is, you know, 0.71%. Debt to capital, on the other hand, is about 41%, which I think is, you know, reasonably healthy. It's not perfect, but it's reasonably healthy. So all in all, Owens Corning looks very attractive. They've only been paying a dividend in a short time since 2014. They have a low payout ratio, which also means there's room for growth. Analysts are looking at, you know, double digit 13% growth going forward. Their long-term growth rate is expected to be 16%. This is a great opportunity that's come from result of the weakness we've seen in the market recently to really pick up a above-average growing business with a decent dividend record at a below-average price. So that's Owens Corning. The next stock is another one you might not be familiar with. It's Industrial Machinery, Parker Hannafin. Once again, I want to go through into the corporate website and learn as much about the company as I can, you know, what they do. They're, they're a global leader in motion and control technologies. You know, there's a lot of information. I'll go through the presentations that they, you know, the companies might create. Again, I'll spend a lot of time here. I'll go into other research sites like, you know, the Wall Street Journal, see if there's any news. I mentioned Seeking Alpha in the previous one. I'm also a subscriber to sites like Morningstar. Um, I would go into Morningstar and, you know, they give it four stars and they do produce a nice report. So I would spend my time understanding the research there. But here's the point I want to make. This company's grown a little bit cyclical, but I would call this quasi-cyclical, been averaging about 11%, 10.9% you know, growth. It's expected to grow slightly faster, or that's really about the same for the next couple of years. And the long-term growth is expected to be pretty much the same. This is a very high-quality company, triple B-plus rated, 36% debt to capital, you know, it has been way overvalued. This is a clear indication and a clear evidence of how overvaluation always reverts to the mean as well as undervaluation. Again, you can see how, you know, the high correlation between stock price and operating results that I mentioned earlier, that's critical when you're dealing with these companies. You know, forecast growth going forward, again, is very, very attractive. If I go ahead and go into the forthcoming Health check, I can go do the health check real quick to give me, you know, some ideas on how the company's been performing. And again, they're, let's start with their margins. Their margins are good, but they're below industry norms, but they're 25% margins. I like that. Their net margins are pretty close to the industry standard. And again, just because that's below the industry standard does not mean it's bad. I want to make that. And they also generate net margin you know, that's, you know, almost double digit in most years, and most years it is double digit. So I give it a, you know, B plus or a B on that, you know, return on assets, you know, the company generates pretty decent returns on assets, seven, eight or 9%. And again, I'm going to go through, you know, return on equity, their return on equity has been above industry norms, their sales and revenue has grown at about 2% a year, it's cyclical, remember, Net income, you know, the numbers look good to me. Asset turnover, you know, they're generally above industry norms and they're real close to meeting industry norms the last couple of years. Operating cash flow above net income, they you know, give passing grades there, you give them an A. And then, of course, I already went through debt to equity, a little higher than industry norms, but still very, very um, acceptable. So I like Parker Hannafin, you know, very much. And then last but not least, I'm going to go through Pentair. Pentair is a company that makes industrial machinery. And, and this is a classic example, and I might have saved this for last because it's kind of the overall theme of this particular video that I'm doing. 
Pentair, first of all, let's give you a little familiar with Pentair. Let, let's go in back into the Seeking Alpha site and let's go into the company profile. They provide various water solutions worldwide, consumer solutions, industrial and flow technologies. You know, they design, manufacture, and sell residential and commercial pool equipment and accessories, pumps, filters, heaters, lights, automatic controls, etc. So, you know, you get a good idea of what the company does. I don't know if Morningstar at this point, because I'm just beginning to research, they give it four stars. They do cover Pentair, which I like that, so that's important. But what I really want you to see here is how valuation is so critically important. You can see these periods of overvaluation where the company's earnings were growing. It's a, you know, they strung together two good years, 36% growth and 42% growth. And the market really you know, ran that up into really high valuations. You could argue they were low valuations relative to the short-term growth they were achieving, but they were very high valuations relative to the long-term growth. And had you bought Pentair here and held it you know, into the recession, you'd have lost half of your money and probably panicked and sold out. But on the other hand, if you'd have bought it when it was fairly valued and took it into the recession, you'd have snuck out a 7 or 8% rate of return. So valuation is important. It matters. It matters a lot. And you can see that every time this company gets disconnected from a rational valuation, here I'm using 15 as the P-E ratio, you know, we get this quick reversion to the mean. They're paying 1.66% dividend, blended PE of 14.3, triple B minus credit rating, 31% debt to capital, and, you know, earnings yield of just under 7%. All of those things I like, but I want you to notice the opportunity that Mr. Market has given us currently. The stock was very vulnerable to any kind of bad news. That's just clear from looking at that picture. And the price adjusted back to fair value. On a going forward basis, analysts are still expecting 8.5% growth, over 10% growth long term. So, you know, this one looks very, very attractive. It did have a little bit of a spotty dividend record. They did have uh, cut it. So here, again, I, as I should have done with all these companies, but just for sake of brevity, I didn't. I would go through operating cash flow. As I mentioned, I would go through free cash flow, covering the dividend very nicely, especially for the last decade or more. That's what I'm most concerned about. I would look at price to sales, very attractive there. You know, I go through all these metrics routinely on every company. For sake of the video, I skipped a few steps on a couple, but those of you who are subscribers, you can go through that. But anyway, the bottom line is they're trading at a little bit higher price to sales than normal, but it's not terrible because, you know, it is somewhat of a cyclical company, as I mentioned. But regardless, I've got a really nice stock here, decent dividend yield, and I haven't had a chance to buy it in a while. And based on buying it here, you know, this would be one that I could even look at, you know, to see if it would, you know, fall a little bit more. Let's check price real quick. You know, we're having a down day in the market. It's down 3.38% from what I'm showing you here. So it's getting even, it's developing even a better margin of safety. This would be one that you'd also want to put in your radar screen. Anyway, this has been Chuck Carnival saying thanks for watching. These are, you know, four stocks that the recent market melees has created opportunities for us to research and possibly invest in with above average returns for the long run. Value investing, that's the real beauty of value investing. It positions you to participate fully in the growth of the business. And buying stocks with dividends gives you the most reliable, predictable metric that you can that you can trust dividends more than price, more than earnings, more than cash flow generation, etc. But again, nothing replaces, you know, comprehensive research and due diligence. If you like the video, give me a like, ring the bell, um, take a look at fast graphs if you haven't already. It's an unbelievable tool. As I always say, I couldn't even imagine investing in stocks without it. I want to thank you all for watching and look forward to talking to you again real soon. Thanks.